Welcome to the Truth and Liberty broadcast. We believe we have a mandate to bring godly change to our nation and the world through the seven spheres or mountains of influence. To further this cause, we give away a product every week that will empower you to get involved in changing your life and changing our world. You can register for our weekly giveaway by subscribing at truthandliberty.net. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to receive weekly updates on guests, news, and much more. This is an interactive live cast and we welcome your questions. To ask a question during the live cast, use the comment or chat features. Now get ready to dive into this week's topics with our hosts on location in Colorado, USA. Hello and welcome to our Monday night Truth and Liberty live cast. I tell you, this is awesome. We've got so much to talk about today. and. You know, I honestly didn't know who our guest was going to be this week, but I was thinking, oh man, we ought to have Bill Federer on here uh, because he's been sending me things this week and guess what? Bill Federer is our guest. He's here with us. This is going to be awesome. So I want you to stay tuned, but first we've got some things that we want to make you aware of how you can participate and actually be a part of this by questions you can uh, give financially. We've got a giveaway, other things. Absolutely. So this is Richard Harris. He's our chief counsel. And, and just real quickly, let me say this, that we've been in litigation with the state for how long, Richard? Oh, it's been since July in one form or another. And we've been served, I think, three cease and desist letters. Yeah. And uh, anyway, we've been in a battle and we just got totally denied last Tuesday, at election night, five o'clock, I think mm -hmm. we got a decision against us. And man, they came after us and threatened us. Jamie got all dressed up in case I got arrested so she could come get me out of town. <laughs> we've been dealing with stuff. It's a pain. And so uh, anyway, uh, we are still alive and Amen. I'm still here and we filed an appeal. Matter of fact, filed that today yeah. and we're going to fight this thing all the way to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. if we have to. And Amen. So, anyway, good things are happening. We've got, if you aren't a part of our ministry yet, please contact us because I wrote a blog today. I made two weeks worth of television that we're sending out to our people about where do we go from here, mm. lessons to learn from the 2020 elections. And there's just a lot of things that I haven't got time to share tonight. But it'll be great with Bill. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is Richard Harris, our, our chief counsel, and he's going to share with you about how you can participate. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to everybody for watching tonight. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Bill is always uh, awesome having Bill on. He's just like an encyclopedia of knowledge. That's right. But uh, it's, it's such a blessing. But uh, thanks for watching tonight. And, and if you're watching on our website, um, uh, you know, that's great. If you're watching by Facebook, we sure encourage you to switch over to truthandliberty.net and watch our live stream from there because uh, uh, your experience will be a lot more reliable. You won't get censored on, on our website. So watch there. And I, speaking of the website, just wanted to remind everybody that we have a resources section on the, on the site that has all kinds of uh, great material for you there. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of those things. One of them is a new resource uh, that is called the Faith Impact Toolkit put out by the Congressional Prayer Caucus. And this, uh, this document, it's pretty thick, but it'll provide you and your churches with all kinds of resources on how your uh, church and, and uh, those in your uh, you know, Christian circles can stand up for Christ and make a difference in this age and in this, this uh, ungodly government that we're fighting against. Wanted to mention also um, the 24 7 news feed. If you didn't know about that, on truthandliberty.net, we have a 24 7 news feed. You really don't need to go anywhere else because all of our uh, favorite, conservative, reliable sources for news, not the fake news that's out there, uh, you can check those out and uh, see the news from a Christian worldview. And uh, that's 24 7. Last thing is we have a lot of prayer guides on there because I know a lot of people right now are really seeking God for the future of our country. and and uh, those may be a blessing to you. Um, I wanted to mention that we have some exciting events coming up here, but it, it'll actually be a little while, but it's not too soon to mention. Uh, the Karis Bible College Men's Advance is March 11th through the 13th. You can check that out on the Karis Bible College website or awmi.net, and uh, that's going to be a fantastic event. It's always great. I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. We've got James Brown and Tony Dungy. Yeah, we've uh, had them the last few years, and man, they're yeah, just, they're, they're awesome. They are awesome. Awesome, man. 
they're not just good speakers, they're awesome people. They are great men of integrity. I yeah. just really, really respect them. Matter of fact, yeah. James and Dorothy usually watch on Monday nights, so <laughs> hi, James. I was watching the, the, oh, I don't know what game it was, but anyway, it was last Thanksgiving and my yeah. son was at home, and uh, I was saying, I know James, and he says, no way. And I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> and so I just texted James and said something about, we're watching on Thanksgiving Day. He texted back during a break, and my son was so impressed. He, yeah. he video sent that to everybody. So that's awesome. That's anyway, awesome. if you're watching James and Dorothy, we love you. You're so best. that's the Karis Men's Advance, and of course, Andrew will be ministering, and others, uh, Greg Moore, Mike Pickett, Billy Epperhart. So you don't want to miss that. And then uh, the Easter presentation of God with us is in April. Um, Every week on the live cast here, we have a free product giveaway for that we, we draw names at random from our subscribers. So if you're not a subscriber to Truth and Liberty, you need to do that. Just go up in the upper right hand corner of our website, click subscribe, and you'll get our weekly newsletter and email that'll help keep you up to date as to what's going on here at Truth and Liberty and, uh, and receive resources that we send out. Uh, this week's, well, let me say last week's winner was Justino Landivar, who won Lessons from David. Congratulations, Justino. Justino, you should be receiving an email shortly with how to get your gift. And this week's product that we're giving away is uh, not one of Andrew's books, but actually Bill Federer's book. And this is Miracles in American History. I think it's, uh, is this the original one? Yeah, this is the first one. 32 Amazing Stories of Answered Prayer. And I think your wife Susie mm -hmm. wrote this uh, based on your awesome American Minute. And uh, it's a real treasure uh, of information about American history. You won't hear this on Fox News or CNN or anywhere else. You can only get it from Bill and it's awesome. So be sure to subscribe and be eligible for that. Um, as Andrew mentioned, it's an interactive live cast. Uh, if you have comments or questions uh, for Bill or Andrew, just uh, type your question in there in the comment section on Facebook or the chat function on our, uh, on our website and uh, we'll try to get to your questions today. Um, we are supported by the donations of our coalition members. Thank you to all of our members today for your generosity. If you're not a member and you want to support the work, the amazing work that God is doing here at Truth and Liberty, you can do that by becoming a member. Just go to our donate page and, and sign up to be a recurring donor, automatic uh, uh, transaction of at least $5 per month, and you'll be a member of the, of the coalition and we'll send you a free gift in the mail. And then last tonight, if you need prayer, you want someone to stand in agreement with you, maybe it's for the United States of America, maybe it's for a loved one or your family or whatever, uh, you can call in to our uh, phone line at 719-635-1111 and a trained uh, minister will, uh, will agree with you according to the Word of God and uh, you'll be blessed. So, and Let me just emphasize again that, you know, uh, the elections that we've just had are, of course, like the elephant in the room. How can we not talk about it? But I want to specifically deal with some uh, things with Bill here in just a moment. But let me say again that I've made over four hours worth of teaching on lessons to learn from this election. And uh, they will be aired in January, but we are going to go ahead and put the raw footage of it on our website. And I forget the exact time, but just in a couple of days it will be there. But again, you've got to be on our mailing list or our email list, or social media. I don't know how we do this, but anyway, you've got to contact us, otherwise you wouldn't know about this. So please sign up. Truth and Liberty people will get that. And I encourage you to take advantage of it because it's, there's really some lessons to learn. So Bill Federer is uh, one of our board members of the Truth and Liberty. He and David Barton, and also Lance Wall now, Karen Conrad. And uh, man, they are just such a blessing. But Bill has so many credits to his name, but from my standpoint, he has a knowledge of history, not only U.S. history, but, but world history. Mm -hmm. And every time we get around him, uh, he just brings uh, truths out that you don't necessarily know. And you know, what you don't know is killing you. Mm. People are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So mm. Bill, we sure appreciate you, brother, and appreciate yeah. you being with us tonight. It's going to be good. Well, it's, it's an honor to be here. And so I hate to just dominate and control what he says because he's, he's got a perspective that very few people have, and I want you to feel free to interject things. But one thing I want to make sure that we cover is that this last election, you know, uh, President Trump is saying that uh, 
there's voter fraud and I've had so many things sent to me this week mm. about the hammer uh, program and all of these kind of things. And um, anyway, I don't know whether to sit there and say yay or nay on this, but you send out an American Minute every day. I read it and this week Bill sent out a American Minute that was talking about Lyndon Johnson, Landslide mm, Lance. Johnson. And uh, that encouraged me so much because I know that there are people watching this and thinking America has just lost its freedom of election. There's corruption. We can't trust our election anymore. This isn't the first time that something like this has happened in the United States. And so I'd like you to bring some of these things you were sharing in this and tell people about what's happened in the past. We survived it and I believe we're going to survive this if the church keeps our faith. Right. So <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson was running for Senate in Texas on the Democrat primary against Koch Stevenson, who was the Democrat governor of Texas. The election happens and Johnson loses. And then there is a box of ballots discovered in uh, Alice, Texas, which happens to be LBJ's hometown. And the campaign manager for LBJ goes down there and it's confusion that reigns for a week. And at the end of the week, lo and behold, they claim to have discovered a box of ballots of 202 extra names. And they looked at these names and they were all voting and signed in in alphabetical order. They were all names from the local cemetery and they all signed in with the same handwriting and the same color ink. And so from the local cemetery, I think Trump was <clears throat> threatening to do something today where he was going to show people who are dead had voted in this election and stuff, similar type thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, Coke Stevenson brings a lawsuit and it goes, works its way up to the Supreme Court and um, there is a Democrat Congressman Abe Fortas and he pulls some strings and the Supreme Court justice that uh, oversees it is Hugo Black and he throws it back to the state and says, well, whatever the state decides stands. Well, you had the Democrat Party tied with certain number of Democrats for LBJ and certain number for Coke Stevenson and they recall a delegate that's on business in Tennessee, bring him back. And he is the deciding vote for LBJ. And uh, this very slim margin that he wins by is joked about. And so they nickname him Landslide Linda. <laughs> it's like it was not a landslide. It was like an extremely, extremely close. But totally they sort of joke about it. Yeah. But everybody knew it was voter fraud that got Lyndon Johnson well, elected to the U.S. You Senate. know, my dad, he died when uh, um, JFK had just been elected. He died, I think, in 61. Mm. But uh, Johnson was vice president and he knew. He says that guy is as crooked as it could be. Anybody in Texas did not trust Johnson mm. at all. And so the uh, political Democrat boss of that county was um, George Parr, and he was called the Duke of Duval, Newton County. <laughs> and uh, when this happens, uh, LBJ wins. Well, shortly after that, he suspiciously commits suicide. So he's not alive to be able to tell what happened. Uh, but then even uh, the New York Times and some of these national papers decades later run stories of people that were involved in the voter fraud coming clean and saying, I was the one who stuffed the ballot box and I did this and I did that. So it's documented yeah. that, that Lyndon Johnson stole the Senate race. And um, now he goes on. Um, he's part of uh, FDR's New Deal. So the New Deal program was the federal government usurping a whole lot of rights and control yeah. over people's lives. And so uh, when Lyndon Johnson is uh, running for re-election, there are some conservative groups in Texas. Uh, there's the Facts Forum, the, Con the Constitutional Coalition, different groups, and they're running and printing pamphlets saying LBJ is for more centralization of power in Washington. He's for more communism in the U.S. He's covering up communist infiltration. And LBJ does not like this 501c3 educational mm -hmm. foundation pointing out that. It, so what does he do? He goes into uh, the IRS hearing and proposes a change to the IRS code that would limit 
501c3s from getting involved in politics. Mm -hmm. And it passes on a voice vote because the Democrats want to shut up these conservative groups and the Republicans want to shut up the Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie Foundation because they're globalist type groups. And uh, but nobody's thinking about churches. He's just thinking of this group that's that's a, a constitutional group. And uh, it wasn't until the 1960s that the ACLU began to send letters to churches saying, you're 501c3, don't you know that, you know. Now, thankfully, uh, Trump has repealed that and said, you can talk about whatever you want in church. But and isn't that a, an executive order? I mean, it's it not is. a law. So if uh, Biden gets elected and comes in, he could just he could. go back to the way it yeah. was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the president is the executive branch. They're the ones, he, that's the branch responsible to enforce the federal laws. And so he basically says, I'm not going to enforce yeah. this. Um, LBJ uh, was uh, then when John F. Kennedy's run for president, Texas is so big, there's lots of electoral votes. So Kennedy decides politically to pull LBJ in to be his vice presidential candidate so that you can get enough electoral votes. Um, LBJ had a long line of corrupt accusations. And Life Magazine ran an article on Bob Barker and one of the ba Baker, one of these people that um, uh, was doing corrupt stuff with LBJ. And it was a front page article in Life Magazine. And so Life Magazine is now going to do a full spread article on LBJ's corruption. And it's going to be published November 24th, 1963. Mm. Well, what happened was November 22nd, 1963 is when Kennedy went to Texas and got shot. So Life Magazine scrapped the, the cover. And of course, the front page was Kennedy got shot. And when uh, LBJ had um, uh, Jackie Kennedy with her still bloodstained dress wait for two hours in Air Force One with no air conditioning, sweating, and they couldn't find a Bible. All the time it was a Catholic missile. But, but he wanted her to stand next to him for a photo op. I mean, he could have sworn in without her, mm -hmm. but he wanted that photo op. And so here's his grieving wife that he made sit there. And um, anyway, uh, and then he gets in and he does the Warren Commission. And lo and behold, um, he basically, any evidence that would point to him is expunged. And then they come up with all the other theories that are the topics for a long time. You got to talk about Abe Fortas too. Right, so Abe Fortas, uh, it ends up that uh, LBJ appoints him to the Supreme Court. So this is the, the, the concept. Congressman that back in his election case. That was involved with the corruption. So you, 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 um, you promote those who are involved in your corruption mm -hmm. um, so that they won't be motivated to snitch on you. And you had also said in that American Minute that I read this last week that uh, LBJ actually started the Vietnam War primarily to divert attention away yeah. from him and the scandals and have the people rally around him because they support a president during wartime. Yeah. Now, the communists were being aggressive and they were taking over countries. And uh, there's uh, this very significant argument that can be, made, can be made that they needed to be stopped. But nevertheless, uh, it probably could have gone about in different fashion. Uh, but all the way back to ancient Greece, it's a standard operating procedure that when a leader becomes unpopular, that uh, matter of fact, in Greece, you had Pericles. He was uh, a leader and it was a democracy. But he was getting so powerful that if you get 6,000 citizens in Athens to vote to ostracize you, you're kicked out of town for 10 years. Your political career is over. And so this rumor was Pericles, he moved the treasury from this little island, uh, you know, to Athens. And then he borrowed money out of the treasury to build a big Acropolis. And he's getting too powerful. And they were talking about ostracizing him. He intentionally lets relations with Sparta deteriorate. And so a Peloponnesian war breaks out with Sparta. And now everybody wants a strong leader in time of war. Mm -hmm. And they sort of forget all the ostracizing talk. And now, you know, but, uh, but he ends up dying. Everybody goes into Athens and they pack in and catch diseases. And well, you know, this election cycle, if, if Biden uh, is declared the president and stuff, the Christians have been saying that, man, this is the end of our republic as we know it. And I mean, we've had such dire predictions trying to motivate people to vote and stuff that I know that there's a lot of Christians right now that are panicking and think we've lost. We've lost this nation. But, but when you hear something like this, LBJ, some people say, but Biden, he was a socialist and stuff. 
LBJ is the one that put into practice or into place the Great Society, which started our welfare state that has basically uh, driven the black men out of the homes and, and black uh, young women are having children because they get paid for it and it has destroyed the family unit among the blacks and on and on you could go. I mean, it was devastating what he did to this nation and yet we have survived and I believe we can survive again if worse comes to worse. Yeah, you, you look at history, every generation has a crisis mm -hmm. and God chooses us to be alive right now and this is the crisis that we're dealing with. Uh, if we get through this, there'll be another crisis. We get through that, there'll be another mm -hmm. crisis. Uh, and the crisis of the era is, is a self sorting out of the sheep and the goats. It's mm -hmm. not the ultimate sorting out, but it gives an opportunity for you to show whose side you're on. And I liken it to um, God knew Abraham's heart, but he wanted to see Abraham take his son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah and be willing to kill him. So people say, God knows my heart. It's like a man that's watching TV and you come up to him and you say, when was the last time you told your wife you love her? I uh, can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, okay, well, when was the last time you did anything to show your wife you love her? Uh, I don't know, but she knows my heart. It's like, Dude, we need to have a little talk here. Um, <laughs> and people say, God knows my heart. Yes, he does know your heart, but he wants to hear some words out of your mouth and he That's wants right. to see some actions. And That's the right. crisis of the era is the opportunity for you to show the actions. That's great. And um, So have we had corruption in, uh, in American politics before? Right. <clears throat> so one of the first ones was Aaron Burr and he was in New York and he was basically, he almost beat Thomas Jefferson out to be the third president. And... Uh, we didn't have a, a, a federal bank, and so Alexander Hamilton started a bank and lent the money to pay Congress's salaries. Well, Aaron Burr decided to um, do something a little bit shady. There wasn't, the water supply in New York City uh, was not sufficient, and so he wanted to start a water company, and he raised all this money. He just used a fraction of the money for, for the pipes. He took logs and hollowed out the logs and used it for pipes. I mean, it was pretty. Anyway, he used the rest of the money to start a bank in the Manhattan Bank, and then he ended up using it to lend money to politicians, and it turned into this political machine in New York, right, the Tammany Hall. And, uh, and he's the one who came up with the winner-take-all for electoral votes for a state. Used to be every congressional district got electoral votes. So forget what the big city does. I don't care. They're just one or two con uh, electoral votes. We got our own for our own. Aaron Burr's the one that, that, that put it together. But this idea of banks, and so then you had somebody named uh, Nicholas Biddle, and he started the second bank of the United States. And uh, different presidents like Andrew Jackson called it a huge electioneering machine. Mm -hmm. And so here, the federal money, federal government's money, is deposited in his bank, and he keeps a little bit and lends the rest of it out, making all kinds of money, but he buys newspapers. And he decides it's, it's the fake news for the day. Mm -hmm. And he'll, uh, but then he pays for the campaigns for all these, and so all these, Congressmen and senators are in, sitting in their seats, but they're there because they're paid for by Nicholas Biddle. So it was Andrew Jackson. Uh, he had, it was a mixed bag. There's good things about him and bad things about him. Um, but the good thing was uh, he took on Nicholas Biddle. It's called the, the Bank War. And there was even in the middle of it an assassination attempt on, on, on Andrew Jackson. And, um, but here you had these corrupt, you know, like a George Soros type, buying uh, political influence and... Um, but as long as every time that the expansion went to include more people in the voting process, the corruption took a new turn. And so whenever they would say, okay, um, and uh, we're gonna allow, you know, 18 year olds to vote. Okay, well now they're, they're gonna uh, target how to sway 18 year olds. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, you had Sears catalog and you had marketing, and then they developed the marketing technique where instead of listing the good and bad about products, they would make it look like the in thing. And you know, uh, a, a you know, fashionable lady smoking a cigarette or something, and then everybody wanted to be part of the in thing. And um, this got transferred into education where it's called the behavior modification, and the kids want to mm -hmm. fit in, they change, but it also got into politics. And so they uh, began to make it look like it was the in thing to vote for this candidate. And it was the controlling of the message in the media. So um, after World War II, uh, England gives independence to its former colonies and they turn into brand new countries and they have brand new leaders. And it's the perfect world, except the Soviet Union decides it wants to 
co-opt these new countries. And so the Soviet Union would send KGB agents into Romania, into Czechoslovakia, into Lithuania, into Poland, and they would find groups with grievances. And they would organize them to riot. Ethnic grievances, you know, Bosnian, Serbs, Croats, uh, religious grievances, Orthodox, Sunni, Shia, um, eth economic uh, grievances, uh, religious, doesn't, doesn't matter. The idea was you break groups into victims and oppressors, haves and have-nots, and you orchestrate protests that you escalate into riots. And then they would co-opt the media with bribes and threats to blame the current leader for all of the problems. And they would even release false polling data prior to a rigged election so that when they would do the coup, nobody would question it. Hmm. And then, like the, us weird. today. And when the country got panicky enough, uh, they would, you know, put the leader under house arrest and... and um, well, let's remember that Black Lives Matter is founded by trained Marxists. So, that's what they said. So I wouldn't be surprised if those same strategies, they were already familiar with those. And is that just a coincidence? Yeah. <laughs> well, and so Truman does nothing. And these countries are fallen and fallen. And then the next president's Eisenhower, and he's faced with a dilemma. He can either sit back, let the communists take over these countries, or fight fire with fire. And so when Iran decides to side with the Soviet Union, and their leader, Mossadegh, nationalizes the oil industry. And you think, well, big deal. Wait a second, Britain has no oil. So in 1908, Britain formed the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. You know it better as BP. BP, British Petroleum, is really the Anglo-Iranian oil company. And so when Iran nationalizes, it takes away. Britain has no oil. So they appeal to Eisenhower for help. Eisenhower approves the first CIA operation to overthrow a country's leader. It's Operation Ajax. And the CIA organizer on the ground is Kermit Roosevelt Jr., the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt. He's an expert in foreign languages. He goes over to Tehran, and he recruits mobsters and gangsters and radical imams, and he stages protests escalate into riots. They attack mosques. Then they co-opt the media with bribes and threats to blame Mazadek, the leader of the country, for all these problems. And then they cultivate weak links in the military. And when the country gets panicky and confused enough, they do a coup. They put Mazadek under house arrest, lock him away for the rest of his life where he dies. And they install the Shah, who loved America because we put him in. And so the CIA did the same thing in Guatemala in 1954, the Congo 1960, Dominican Republic, even Chile 1973. Mm. And the KGB did the same thing with Brezhnev hu hugging, helping Yasser Arafat starting the PLO and Brezhnev hugging Castro and the Soviets uh, infiltrating and taking over countries, Latin South America and Africa and the Chinese the same in the Far East. This is called the Cold War, right? And so these are tactics that have been perfected on how to go into a country, find groups with grievances, stir them up until there's rioting, co-opt the media to blame the leader of the country for all the problems, release false polling data prior to a coup, and then when you do it, they don't question it, and then you install whatever leader you want. Mm. And so we already know there are people in the uh, deep state that don't like the current president, and they've been trying different tactics. Uh, this has fingerprints of um, having some insider type of um, uh, involvement. Mm. So, Bill, let me ask you, this is disturbing. It's disappointing. It's uh, uh, depressing. Mm. So, what do we do? This has been going on much longer than our lifetime. It's been going on throughout history. Most people think that America, somehow or another, is purer than that, that our elections mm -hmm. have not been rigged, have not been tampered with, and yet all these things you're bringing out say that this has been going on the whole time. How do we respond? Where do we go? Yeah, if you, uh, if you keep your lawn mowed, the weeds stay in check, but if you don't mow the lawn, the weeds uh, end up taking over the whole thing. So as long as you have the majority of the people having morals in a country, you'll have weeds here and there, but by and large, you're going to maintain a moral country. But if the Christian people don't get involved over a long enough period of time, the sinful weeds grow unchecked and then it gets to the place where they've taken over the lawn. And now it's a big challenge to try to redo your lawn. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it is a, a crisis. Uh, it's been done on smaller levels. This is the biggest on a national level to do uh, voter fraud. And uh, I ran for Congress three times personally experienced 
on election night getting a phone call from our volunteer at the you know board of election and they're like um they can't find the box of ballots from guffey elementary school which happens to be the largest county and uh, lar largest precinct in jefferson county and i stood eight hours in front of guffey elementary school shaking hands and here i have my volunteer telling me they cannot find the box of ballots mm. from that precinct and i stood in front of it for eight hours that day mm. in the cold and while i'm talking to this person my opponent gets on tv and says he just won Mm. Like what? They didn't even count the county. And, uh, and then I, I ran three times. Uh, another time I ran, they left my name off the ballot in five wards in the city of St. Louis. People went into vote for me. My name wasn't there. And it was sort of like they planned it. And then once we, we caught them in it, they're like, oh, OK, we'll tell you what. We'll just leave the polls open till 10 o'clock and tell everybody to come back and vote again. And downtown, we'll leave them open till midnight. No. So we, we go downtown and there's like people lined up around the streets and yeah. everything. So they, they plan. And so the mail in voting to me looks like it was a planned excuse to have um, a, a fraud take place, but have it cover under the cover because you cannot verify mail in ballots. That's what President Trump was saying was before the elections. Yeah. Well, Bill, I asked you at lunch today, you know, what do what can Christians do right now? Um, and you had mentioned maybe uh, something about calling their congressman or something along those lines? Yeah, yeah. You need to call your congressman and senators and tell them to scream bloody murder. <laughs> you need to say, get out there. Don't let Trump take all the heat by himself. You need to say that we are not going to go along. I believe this is the end of mainstream news. I believe that Fox News has been drifting and drifting and drifting yeah. after mm -hmm. this election, especially after their, you know, correspondent that called election called Arizona if, while there's still a half million people that and haven't been counted. I heard that that man is a registered Democrat and has spoken vocally against Trump, the guy who mm -hmm. called that. Yeah, so I think my, the same way that the NFL, I don't think is going to recover. No, the, all this. I haven't uh, watched them. All, all the uh, kneeling protests. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of empty stadiums for a long, long time. I think the same thing has happened with mainstream news. And I think that other than Tucker Carlson <laughs> and maybe a couple others, uh, I think that, that Fox has delegitimized itself as a trustworthy conservative yeah. voice. So what are you going to do for your news? You're going to go to <laughs> Truth and Liberty. You're going to go to some of these other alternative ones. Uh, but I think there's, there's a sea change. And I think that... Uh, People say, well, what's God going to do? I think God's looking at us to decide what's, what he's going to do. And, and you were talking about reading the book of Jeremiah. It's full of these ifs. Jeremiah tells Zedekiah, the king, if you do this, Jerusalem will be spared. It will not be burnt to the ground. But if you do not do this, all your wives are going to be taken away and your kids will be killed and everything. And it's a lot of ifs. And, and people say, well, what do you think the Lord's going to do? I think he's watching us to decide, right? Are we going to get involved? Are we going to, but as you said, Richard, I think we do need to call our congressmen and senators and say, stop letting Trump be the only one to take the heat. Mm. And you know, this, uh, these programs that I was talking about that I made last week, one of the points that I was making is that this election shouldn't even have been close. Mm -hmm. We had probably the clearest choice between light and dark, uh, good and evil. I mean, one that wanted to push abortion even after birth, push LGBT, <clears throat> uh, radicalize everything, socialism, communism versus the opposite. It shouldn't have even been close enough that mm. they could have cheated on this thing. This goes back to the body of Christ has not stood up and has not been the salt and the light. And so one of the things we can do, yes, contact congressmen and stuff, but the body of Christ has got to start speaking out and changing the morals of this nation, which the gospel is the only thing that can do that. That's right. Yeah, I, and I think we, we cannot give up without a fight. In, in other words, we've got two months before the, the transition. Let's fight this thing all the way to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Let's not say, well, this is God's will. We've got to accept it. It's like, no, God wants us to, uh, in America, the people are the king. Right? Uh, it, it'd be, uh, it's a, we the people. It's a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The politicians are our servants. We hire them and you fire them. You cannot have one candidate having rallies with 20,000 people showing yeah. up and another candidate having nobody show up. Yeah. But you know what? All the way back to, um, to Plato, um, and he talked about how the philosopher king, a dictator, will seize power and he will teach noble lies. Plato says, we want one grand lie that will be believed by the whole country. And so Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's Nazi, which is National Socialist Workers Party. Uh, 
Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's minister of propaganda. Could you imagine having a, a on your business card? <laughs> anyway, so uh, Joseph Goebbels said, tell a lie, make it big enough, repeat it over and over, and people will end up believing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so just because there's a lie, and it's a big lie, and it's repeated over and over again, does not mean it's true. Mm -hmm. It's just a lie. Mm -hmm. And so we need to call them on it. And, um, and I've seen, uh, you know, throughout the Bible stories, whenever the enemy comes in, at first he comes in like a flood, and it looks hopeless. And at that moment, you could cave. But if you hang in there in faith and say, my, my every sense that I have tells me it's over, but I'm just going to hang on to that faith in the Lord. Yeah. And then once you do that, it starts growing and growing and growing until pretty soon you begin to see like Elijah telling his servant, look, there's mm -hmm. chariots, there's more that are on our side, Amen. you know, chariots of fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me say that I wrote a blog today. I don't know if the blog's the right word for it, but I wrote a little thing today and told my staff to get it out through social media, through emails, everything. And it was basically that I heard a leader in the body of Christ say that God sovereignly puts in the president. And so if, if Biden winds up being the one, then God is the one who put him in. And man, I just hate that. I disagree with that 1,000%. And let me just give you one scripture that if you believe the Bible, it disproves that. And that's Hosea chapter 8, verse 4, and it says, And they have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. I mean, right there, the Lord just clearly says that I wasn't a part of you putting this king yeah. in. I'm not the yeah. one who put that prince there. God doesn't put people in who are going to kill and expand the killing of babies by the millions, even babies that have been born alive. He's not the one putting in people that are pushing the LGBTQ uh, agenda and causing social upheaval. He's not the one that's putting in people that are going to socialize everything and radicalize it. That's not God. And I tell you, that attitude has made many Christians be passive to where they didn't even get out and vote. And then there, there's others that are just caving in, as you were talking about, Bill, because they just don't feel like we have anything to do with it, that God sovereignly does this. And that is not true. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, ancient Israel, for 400 years did not have a, have a king. And then the priest stopped teaching the law mm -hmm. and you had the high priest, the main guy that's supposed to be teaching it, his own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent where the Ark of the Covenant is. Mm -hmm. And then another Levite has a silver graven image and, and you're scratching your head and what's a Levite doing with a graven image? Isn't that one of the commandments? And then another Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levites to marry a virgin of his own tribe. They're traveling there in a house surrounded by sodomites. Something about that behavior that appears at the last stages of a people ruling themselves is casting off the self-restraint. The poor girl gets raped to death. And um, then it says that every man does what's right in their own eyes, turns into chaos. Finally, they go to Samuel the prophet and they say, this self-government system's not working anymore. Mm. We want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. Mm. Samuel cries and the Lord tells him, they have not rejected you. They have rejected me mm -hmm. that I should not reign over them. And then, so Samuel gives him Saul and then a lightning comes and storms and destroys their crops. And the people said, we sinned in asking for a king. And he said, yes, you did sin, mm -hmm. but God will still work his plan. Mm. In other words, God respected their choice. Right. right. So it wasn't right. God that, that put in Saul necessarily. It was God saying, you rejected me. And, you know, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. And they asked for a king. We're going to give them a king. And, and Saul reigned as a tyrant. Yeah. He had all these, the 70 priests come in and he had his guy Doeg, the Edomite, kill them all. And there wasn't even a trial. And mm. I tell you, this is just wrong for people to think that God just sovereignly does this. If I had time, I could turn to Romans 13 and explain that about that there is no power but those that are ordained of God. God ordained power. He ordained government, but He does not ordain all of the people in government and the way they exercise it. So anyway, there's an answer to all of this, but if you just use your brain for something besides a hat rack, you can figure out that God does not control us like a puppet, you have a choice. You can choose to go live in sin or to live holy and stuff. And if God doesn't control you, what makes you think that He just controls everything that happens and that nothing happens but what is God's will? Mm -hmm. That doctrine is deadly. And uh, I believe that the, the promotion of that is one reason that the church is so apathetic because mm -hmm. they just 
feel like, well, God, if it's your will, it'll happen. Now, one of the, um, I'm, I'm not a theologian, but the one concept is that for God, time stands still. He created time, which means he has to be outside of time in order for him to create it. So in other words, we can all make our free will decisions, but every single moment for God is an eternity. He can sort of look sideways, right? And he can readjust every atom and every variable and every, everything so that his will is going to take place. But within that, we get to make our own free will decisions. And um, anyway. You know, I was just had uh, Bobby Andy in on last Tuesday night on our Bible study. And we were talking about this very thing. And anyway, he went out and saw Bill Johnson out in California. And uh, he was at, I forgot exactly the, the setting of it, but anyway, uh, he said something about, Bill Johnson said, are you, are, what do you think about revival? And Bob says, oh, we're praying for it. And, he, and Bill Johnson said, you don't pray for revival. You go out and cause revival. Mm. He says, what are you doing to cause revival? Wow. And Bob just said, oh yeah. And he said he had to readjust all of his theology. But see, that's a this powerful is, word. That is. And revival, seeing this nation return to God isn't something that you just pray for. I'm not against prayer, but faith without works is dead. Prayer without corresponding actions is dead. Mm. We've got to get involved. We've got to speak out. And that's the reason that this election was so close was because we have lost the morality in America. You know, I'm sitting here listening. This is amazing listening to you, but I'm thinking about um, what's happened to the church in America in the last 25, 30 years and the mega church movement, the seeker friendly stuff mm -hmm. and all of that where our kids aren't really being uh, discipled. They're not going to Sunday school. Messages are 20 minutes, you know, and it's all just uh, superficial kind of, you know, sugar and, and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, do pastors need to wake up and realize that they're not actually obeying Christ and they're not making disciples? And that's the, is that the root of our problem here? Well, um, the, uh, the book you held up is Miracles in American History, Volume 1. We did mm -hmm. a Volume 2, my wife and I, uh, Susie Federer, and it traces revivals throughout American history. Mm -hmm. First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, uh, you know, the, the Missionary Revival, the uh, Blayman's Prayer Revival. And one of the things you see is it's in times of crises that people turn to Christ, That's right? True. Personally, do you pray more when everything's going good or do you pray more when there's a crisis, right? And so what's a nation but a whole bunch of individuals? And so, you know, God has plan A and plan B. Plan A is he blesses us, we turn to him out of gratefulness. If that doesn't work, there is plan B. He withholds the blessings and there's crisis and we turn to him out of desperation. So it's in time to crises that people turn to Christ. And, uh, but also it's the preaching of the law that causes people to see their need for the lamb. Mm -hmm. It's the teaching that God is a just God, Amen. which means he has to judge every sin that causes you to seek God through Jesus, the Lamb of God who exhibited God's love, that Jesus was the Lamb that took the punishment for all of our sins. So God has to judge every sin you've ever done because in law, silence equals consent. In the old wedding ceremonies, the pastor says, anybody against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're sitting there silent during the ceremony, your silence is giving consent to the wedding. So if there's sins going on and God is silent, uh, his silence would effectively be, be giving consent to the sin. If God gives consent to sin, he's no longer a just God. He denies himself. And the Bible says God cannot deny himself. So what does he do? He's a just God. He has to judge every sin, but he's a loving God and that he provided the lamb, Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God to take the judgment for all of our sins. And so we approach God through the lamb. So when you preach the law, People say, gee, I've sinned. Yeah, it's one strike and you're out. If you want to go to heaven by being good enough, all you have to do is sin one time and you're under God's judgment. You don't have to break every law for the policeman to pull you over and arrest you. All you got to do is break one law and he'll arrest you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to go to heaven by being good enough, it's one strike and you're out. And once you preach that, then people realize, wow, uh, I'm in a very desperate situation. I need help. Okay, here's help. Jesus, he died on the cross to pay for all your sins. Thank God for Jesus. So in the first great awakening, you had Jonathan Edwards preach what? Sinners in the hands of an angry God, yeah. right? You had the second great awakening. You had Charles Finney and his laws on, on revival. And he talked about you had to preach the law before people. In other words, people have to realize they're sinners before they yeah. see a need for a savior. Well, we've, we could go on a long time uh, you know, at the time we're making this, uh, that we don't know for sure who's president. Biden has accepted or proclaimed uh, 
that he's won, but Trump is fighting it. And so we, anyway, it's a little premature to say that. But everything we've said tonight is absolutely true, that America is in a moral crisis. It's the church's fault. We've got to start speaking out and taking a stand. And so anyway, it's been real timely what we're saying here. We got some questions here? We've got a lot of questions tonight, uh, Andrew. I, I'm going to start with uh, Ruthie on chat. This is a really good question. She's, she says, I still have hope that President Trump will be reelected even when fake news media is projecting Biden as the president Amen. elect. If, however, Biden were to become president, you know, here's the question, is it possible for a nation to fully recover from socialism? Uh, it, it, it's, if, it's, if it does, it's really, really hard. Why? Because they consolidate all the power uh, and all the different positions. Um, they will, um, you, you look at the way socialists have taken over countries. They basically eliminate everybody that stands up against them. And, um, uh, you know, there's uh, Hitler. So uh, Germany was a republic. It was the Weimar Republic in the 1920s. And Hitler started a political party called the National Socialist Workers' Party, right, Nazi. And he had a violent arm in his party, sort of like a BLM group. Oh, Black Lives group. Matter? Oh, no. It that's... was uh, uh, <laughs> called Brown Shirts. Uh, they were nicknamed Sturmabteilung, which in German means storm trooper. And they would storm into the meetings of Hitler's opponents and disrupt the meeting. And then they would lock arms and block access to buildings. And could you imagine people locking arms and blocking streets? And then they went <laughs> into the city, uh, the cities of Germany, and they smashed the windows of over 7,000 Jewish stores and looted and burned them in the night of broken glass. Crystal Knox. Did you know that the, the anniversary of that is today? Wow. Is that November right? the 9th is the day that they did Interesting. Wow. I learned that through your American Minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can sign up for it, American Minute. Yeah, there you go. It's awesome. Uh, but the, uh, in this confusion, Hitler seizes power, has all of his opponents rounded up and shot without a trial. The dust settles. Germany transitioned from a republic to a socialist dictatorship, right? Uh, and it goes back to the French Revolution. So uh, we had a revolution. France had a revolution. Uh, they helped us in ours, and all they got in return for it was debt and then their crops failed. And so the people of France said, if we can just chop off the king and queen's heads, all of our problems will be solved. So they chop off King Louis the 16th, Queen Marie Antoinette, doesn't get any better. So then they chop off the heads of the royalty, doesn't get any better. They chop off the heads of the wealthy, doesn't get any better. Chop off the heads of the businessmen and farmers. You got food and supplies we don't, you're selfish. They chop off the heads of the hoarders. They chop off the heads of the clergy. Uh, and this is the same thing they're trying to do now. I just read that in this last election cycle that, uh, San Francisco passed some law where they put a tax on anybody who makes 100 times more than their lowest paid employee. It's an executive, uh, excessive executive salary or something that you have to pay one-tenth of your percent of your gross income as taxes. And if you're 200% more, you have to pay 2% on, on up, you know, and things like this. They're taking the money from the wealthy and giving it to the poor. And so the motto of the French Revolution was liberty, equality, fraternity. Now, fraternity was their word for socialism. The group, the fraternity, the yes. collective. And equality can be understood two ways. In America, equality was equal treatment before the law, equal opportunity. In France, it was everyone having an equal amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. And if the fraternity, the group, thinks you have too much stuff, you can use the power of the state to take away your stuff to, and redistribute it and even kill you. And um, anyway, uh, they want to de-Christianize France. They didn't want done in the year of the Lord, so they made 1792 the new year one. They didn't want a seven-day week because it went back to the Bible, so they came up with a 10-day week. They said 10 was the number of man because you count with 10 fingers, so they made every measurement in France divisible by 10. They called it the metric system. And um, it was an intentional effort to de-Christianize France. There was a country rural, er rural area called the Vendee, and they send their army there, and they... Um, uh, kill 300,000 men, women, and children, considered the first modern genocide. And so this became the model for every socialist revolution. You kill off the old order, and then you put your people in. And um, uh, so it, it, it's possible for things to turn around, but it's, we're basically under judgment. And you know, if, if you, I'm sorry. Well, uh, I'm going to take a little bit of encouragement by looking at some of those Eastern European countries that were under communism for decades. But like, if you look at Poland, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and those nations right in there, they're very, uh, there, there's a lot of freedom now, a lot of uh, um, 
you know, uh, demo, uh, free enterprise and that kind of thing in those nations. So I don't know, maybe there is hope that we can rebound well, from this. There is. But, um, but it's hard. I was there hard. when the communism came down and those people had never had a three, free thought. They didn't know how to right. vote and they struggled for decades. Mm -hmm. and, and it was because of Ronald Reagan standing up to the Soviet Union mm -hmm that they were, so that America was good, we were a force for good yeah. in the world. Um, but again, we have to realize every generation has a crisis. Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, bubonic plague. And if we get through this crisis, there'll be another one. We get through that one, there'll be another one. So the crisis of the era is an opportunity for you to show whose side you're on. And you can be part of the problem, ignore the problem, or be part of the answer, letting God use you to minister to the lost and dying, his love to a hurting world, a stand up for righteousness, defend the defenseless. So God chose for us to be alive right now. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. He's given us great teachers uh, like Andrew Wamek. And uh, so this is an opportunity for us to let the Lord use us in the course of our day in our life to stand up for righteousness and to minister. Um, I do think that God is uh, doing something. Uh, I am supporting the president. I know a couple people on his staff and I text him. I tell him to fight, 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 because mm -hmm. not just is America's fate, but the entire world's is right. fates in the balance. That is true. And yeah. let me say that, you know, you were talking about equality in France and they, their idea of equality is different than others. Well, Nancy Pelosi has, you know, tried to pass the Equality Act and mm -hmm. because the Senate wouldn't sign on to that, but she said that if they gain back the Senate, the first thing they are going to do is make the Equality Act that they tried to pass to where transgenders now have all of the rights and stuff. And what it will do is silence the church. It'll criminalize the church. And if the church stands up and says, no, marriage is between a man and a woman, we will literally be a foul of the law and be thrown into jail, That's fined, right. whatever. <clears throat> and uh, it's a crisis situation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I wanted to mention if uh, any of our viewers out there in Georgia or North Carolina, those two Senate seats are the key now to the Republicans holding on to the U.S. Senate. And uh, there's going to be a runoff in Georgia, and they're still counting in North Carolina. But uh, w anybody living in Georgia and knowing people in Georgia, you've got to vote in this runoff election. We cannot lose that yeah, seat. Right now, we're 48 and 48. Mm -hmm. There's two that haven't been decided. Yep. And if they were to win both of those, then it would be at the best 50-50 and the vice president would make the deciding vote, which That's would right. basically give it to the Democrats. That's right. Yeah. Well, here's another question for you, Bill, um, which is uh, uh, there's a lot of people wondering what uh, what is the evidence of fraud in this election? What do you see out there? Was this election really stolen? Yeah, well, there's uh, one where in uh, Philadelphia some uh, Democrat workers showed up with 169,000 ballots and just dumped them off. Um, you had ones where receiving ballots after um, the close of, of the election time, uh, having mail-in ballots with no postmarks, which means it wasn't mailed in, mm -hmm. um, ones that they wanted to verify signatures. There were four cases that would have stopped voter fraud. And Amy Comey Barrett recused herself and they were thrown back to the states and allowed to do to me it's a conundrum i mean here uh she could have she could have stopped voter fraud right then and there it could have been five four but she recused herself for some unknown reason and so now we've got uh that where they can drop off ballots uh, one of them they extended it to november 10th uh, they can, you can continue to fight and so forth or, or drop off ballots that far. I heard one account that they brought in a whole bunch of ballots from a county and 100% of them were all for Biden. Oh, that is impossible. Right? Yeah, statistically impossible. And then another is uh, voter turnout. So you have, um, you know, 100% of people in a precinct. And normally you'll have maybe 60% vote or something. They have... 100, 110%. 110, 120, 130%. It's like, how do you get? And then they list the names on some of these states where you can see the names of people that voted. And some of these people are 130 years old. These are names of people that lived during the Civil War, and yet they are down as a registered voter. Mm. Uh, some of the other ones, they took all of the people that did not vote and yet they're on the registered voter rolls and they went in the back room and just checked them and they got video of them just filling out one ballot, coming home, filling out another one. And this, 
And it's um, that's the reason they put up stuff so that the observers couldn't yeah, see another what was place. Going. They said all Republican poll watchers have to get out. It's like why would you do that? Right? Unless you're doing something dishonest. And um, uh, I tell you, that's disturbing. Well, we got time for one last question. All right. So um, here, here's uh, uh, <laughs> oh, we've got so many. Um, shouldn't this be the best time to give than ever before? Elaine on Facebook. What does that have to do with the elections? Well, I'm not sure. How about... <laughs> uh, it's good to give to the Lord's work. There is a good question on here about 501c3. Why are so many churches in contract with the government where the government seems to be the head and not God? I, this, I don't, the question, let me rephrase it and ask this. Wouldn't our churches be a lot more effective? Wouldn't pastors be more free to talk about these issues if they abandoned that 501c3 status? Because churches don't have to have it in order to be tax exempt. Right. So churches, God gives commands to five groups, individuals, families, employer, employees, church and government. God, there are commands for individuals to take care of the poor. There's really no commands for the family. The commands for the family are mostly husbands, love your wives, children, submit to your parents. There's really no commands for employers, employees to take care of the poor. Those commands are doing honest aid's work and don't hold back wages. There are commands for the church to take care of the poor. Historically, the church has started hospitals and orphanages and medical. There's no commands for the government to take care of the poor. The command to the government's the shortest. Protect the innocent, punish the guilty. What's happened is the government has usurped the church's role. So historically, the church has done all the social programs, the feeding of the, the orphans and the widows. And, and so the church got tax exemption because they fulfilled this, this duty that you know, missionary organizations in other countries are, are do, still doing right now. So they got the tax exemption for doing that. But um, anyway, um, uh, theoretically, uh, the church should be doing that no matter what tax exemption they get or they don't get. Let me just add, you know, that we are in this court battle and we've had the county come down hard on us. And I mean, it's been very aggressive yep. and dictatorial. I called them the Gestapo that they had in every room yep. watching what we're doing. But did you know if every church in Woodland Park in Colorado Springs was to stand up and exert our rights, they wouldn't have a problem. But mm -hmm. because we are one uh, religious group standing up by ourselves, they're fighting us. That's right. And so one of the things that we can do is churches need to get out from under this fear of man and start representing the Lord and this nation and the freedoms that we've been given accurately. And if we do that, we could turn things around. Amen. We're, we're just about out of time. We hadn't got much time left, but Bill, I just appreciate you so much. Man, I feel like every time I get around him, I wonder, what have I been thinking? What have I been reading? I don't know any of this <laughs> stuff. But it's an exciting time. And, and again, the good Lord chose for us to be alive at this time. And we need to have backbone. We need to say, what are the stories that encourage you? Gideon standing up against 100,000 Midianites. You know he had to be we're discouraged. We're going to have to go. We're on CTN and they put us on their broadcast and we've got to quit at exactly the right time. So, Bill, again, I appreciate it. Thanks to CTN. Thanks to all of you for watching. Remember that we do this every Monday night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And I tell you, we have some great guests just like Bill yeah. Federer on every single time. And it will inform you and encourage you. So we encourage you to be a part of it. Join with us at truthandliberty.net. You can go there and become a member. And uh, we would appreciate it and you'll be blessed. God bless you. We'll see you again next week for another Truth and Liberty live cast. Join us next time for the Truth and Liberty broadcast. Find tonight's episode and related articles and links at truthandliberty.net. Truth and Liberty is viewer supported. If you'd like to help us continue our live casts, you can make a donation at truthandliberty.net.